in the first chapter of his epistle to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul boldly declares his hope that the Lord will always be exalted through him, whether in death or life. The reason Paul states very clearly in verse 21, for me to live is Christ. This sentiment is the heartbeat of to live is Christ ministries and the Bible teaching of Dr. Wayne Barber. Wayne's intense love of scripture and passionate desire to please the Father led him to pursue this conference-based outreach after more than 30 years of pulpit and Bible teaching ministry, a decision God has honored by keeping Wayne on the road most every week of the year. What you're about to hear is from the second installment of a powerful eight-part set in the series titled The Power of the Christ Life. Each message offers practical guidelines for understanding who you are in Christ and utilizing the limitless power of the cross to fulfill God's will for your life now and forevermore. What happens if everything seems to be going right? You take a step of obedience to God and wind up facing the trial of a lifetime. Wayne Barber takes us to Genesis 22 for what he calls character in the midst of crisis, God's design for withstanding trials. I'd like to welcome you to our second series on the Christ Life Messages. Our first series of eight studies that many of you have gone through basically gave the platform of what the Christian life really is. It's really the normal Christian life. The ABCs of Christianity. Not me living like Christ, but Christ coming to live his life in and through me. And that was our first series that we did. Now what we're doing in this study is that we're moving, we're extending it out a little bit. Now that I know that I can't, and God never said I could, but he can, he always said he would, how, does that, how do I relate to circumstances of life? Because life is not always pleasing. Many things happen that I didn't plan for, and God sometimes allows things into my life that I would not have expected. How then can I find grace in the midst of the storm? We want to pray as we get into this. Hopefully, this will help you as you learn that life works for us, not against us, when we've received the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity now as we launch into this new study. And our prayer is, Father, that you would quicken truth to our hearts. I pray, Father, we would understand that nothing gets to us that does not come by Jesus first. And Father, I thank you that you live in us, in the person of your Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, that's there to enable us to be everything you've commanded us to be. Thank you, Father, you're in control of every circumstance of our life. Thank you that you're sufficient. And so, Father, let us see in Scripture how life works for us. We praise you. In my weakness, would you be my strength? And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at one of the most exciting stories in Scripture. It's a story about Abraham and something that God told him to do that teaches us the lesson we want to look at in this first study. And that lesson is this. Before you ever come to accepting what God says, you've got to learn to trust his character. If a person does not trust the character of God, I've been doing a study on my own in my devotional time and on the God is phrases in the New Testament. I haven't gotten to the Old Testament because there's several thousand of them, but I'm just into the New Testament. God is love. God is light. God is faithful. And these, all of these terms are there. Many times don't even have the verb there, which is called a Hebraism, which means he is. Don't ever question it. That's what he is. That's who God is. Is. Now, do we understand that that's his character? You see, if you don't understand the character of God and trust the character of God explicitly, then when you go through difficult times and his word tells you what to do, you're not going to receive it. First of all, you're going to have difficulty even knowing if God's in it. Abraham was told to do something that absolutely must have just threatened his own understanding. Now, before we go any further into Genesis 22, keep it there, turn with me to Galatians. I want to show you something. Why is it that Abraham is called the father of faith? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6 through 9 tells us why. We hear him call that. He's the father of faith. What is faith? Faith is learning to surrender and trust God. Why is Abraham called the father of faith? Well, in Genesis 15, verse 6, it tells us that he believed and he was, it, was, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. But G Galatians 3 sums it up for us. It says in verse 6, even so, Abraham believed God. Now, do we know in our study that if the word believe, if it does not affect our behavior, is not belief. 
You can comprehend something about God, but if it does not affect your behavior, you have not yet believed. Believe must affect your behavior. Abraham heard what God said, comprehended it, trusting his character, believed. He acted upon it. It says, even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Now that's that verse in Genesis 15 and verse 6. He sets the pattern right there for our salvation. Then it goes on in verse 7. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Now, there, that's why we're, he's called the father of faith. If you've ever enacted faith, in other words, if, you, if you've ever acted upon what God has said, you believe, it's affected your behavior, you've received the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, then you become a believer and you can say, you, you kind of related to Abraham in that sense of the word. Abraham did the same thing. But not only did Abraham set the pattern for how a person is to be saved, it's simply by faith. There's no works at all. He also set the pattern for how a person walks once he's saved. Look with me over at Hebrews chapter 11. There's one event in the life of Abraham that is so significant. Hebrews chapter 11. If you get to the book of James, go left. <laughs> I always have difficulty when I get to James. Do I go right? Do I go left? Go left. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. It's interesting about Abraham. You could cite many instances in his life, but there's one particular instance that proved him to be a righteous man that sets the pattern for you and I when we walk by faith. Verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Now that's the passage we're going to be looking at in, in Genesis chapter 22. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. And look at verse 19. Here is the trust that he had in the character of God. God told him that Isaac was going to be the door to all the promises, the covenant promises, not only to Israel but to all of us. In verse 19, he considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Now let's don't stop there. Go on. James chapter 2, verse 21. It's so significant that you realize that Abraham sets the pattern for salvation and for how to walk once you're saved. Walking by faith, living in surrender to what God says, trusting his character explicitly. Verse 21 of James chapter 2. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now when you read that, sometimes people think that he's contradicting the Apostle Paul. Paul says we're saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now wait a minute. James says that Abraham was justified by his works. Something you need to learn right here. In the Greek language, the original, this word is the word D-I-K-A-I-O-O, -O, transliterated, the kai -O, o And the two O's on the end of that verb tell you much. You've got to understand this. When those O's are there, I call them the uh-oh verbs. When the two O's are there, it means he was not justified in the sense of salvation, but he was proven to be justified. That's very, very important. If you don't know that, you can think that James is contradicting the Apostle Paul. But what he's saying is he was proven to be justified. Now, what proved him to be a believer? What, what act did he do? And it says, when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. That event, the same event that Hebrews brings up, the event that James brings up, and the event that we're going to be looking at in this study in Genesis chapter 22, that event proved Abraham to be a righteous man. And therefore he becomes the father of faith, not setting, only setting the pattern of how to be saved, but also how to live once you're saved. You know, Paul said in Colossians, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the same way now, walk, so walk ye in him. There's nothing different. You trust God, therefore you act upon his word. But you've got to trust the character of God. If you don't trust the character of God, you'll live your life shaking your fist in his face. When difficult times come, you won't even believe that he could have anything to do with them. You've got to trust his character. Genesis chapter 22. And let's ease into three things that Abraham does that tells us immediately that he trusted the character of God. The same test is going to be in your life and going to be in my life. Circumstances will come our way we did not plan, and God's going to speak to us. Many times he tells us to do the hard things. That's what we don't want to do. When somebody gives me a trouble, when I was in the pastorate, I'd want to say, God, can you change your, your rules here? Could I just have the weapons of flesh for about 10 minutes? 
I'm 6'7", I weigh 265 pounds. I believe I can straighten this matter out. God, let me take these people that are causing me all this problem behind the building, and I think in 10 minutes we can decide who's going to run this church and who's going to follow. But he says what? He says, no, that's not the way you do it, Wayne. It's not the way you do it. Your weapons are not of the flesh. That's just an illustration. All through life it's that way. If you want to get, you give. If you want to live, you die. And God says the hard things. Now, do we understand his character? And do we realize that what he's telling us is for our own good? Then life can start working for you if we can just start trusting the character of God. Well, verse 1 of Genesis 22. The first thing I want you to see is in, it shows that Abraham really trusted the character of God was that he was willing to die to his own understanding. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that, that God does away with your intellect. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is he understood God fully. In all of his intellectual facilities, he understood what God said. However, he didn't comprehend why God would say it, but he went ahead and did what God told him to do. Verse 1, that came about after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son. That's interesting. I thought there was an Ishmael here. You know the story of Abraham when God told him he'd have a son and and he said, thank you, Lord. He and Sarah tried for 13 years. Nothing came around, or at least that long. And, And finally, she said, why don't you go to Hagar, the handmaid? And so he had Ishmael, but it wasn't what God had intended. And God allowed that boy to grow up. <laughs> and years later, when he was 99 years old and Sarah was 90 or 89, he said, by the way, Abraham, remember the child that I told you you was going to have? Remember that? Yes, Lord, he's right here, Ishmael. No, no. He said, Abraham, you missed my whole point. No, you and Sarah are going to have a child. And he went and told Sarah, and Sarah laughed. And so they named him Isaac. And Isaac in the Hebrew language means laughter. God got the last laugh. Hebrews 11 said he gave her the ability to bear a child past the childbearing years. In God's eyes, only one son, the son of faith, the one where Abraham had to believe God, and God brought about a child in older days. He says, now you take your son, your only son. And some people believe at this time he could have been around 20 years old. Your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Now, you know where Moriah is? Moriah was where David purchased a piece of land that the temple is now on, and Israel looks at it as the most sacred place in the world to this day. There's a bedrock there that we believe that that's where actually he took Isaac to sacrifice and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I'll tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey. And it goes on to say, he didn't bat an eye. He didn't blink. He did exactly what God told him to do. Now I'll tell you something. Let's talk about that for a second. Isaac was the key to every promise God had given to Abraham. We're a result of the promises, the everlasting covenant that God gave to Abraham. And through Abraham, you see, there's going to be a son, Isaac. And of course, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and 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 Esau. And Jacob was the one that that carried it on, the covenant promises. And and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Israel had 12 sons, and there were 12 tribes of Israel. But it was out of those tribes of Israel that Judah would come. And out of the line of Judah, it would be David. And out of David's line, the Lord Jesus would come to be born on this earth. If Isaac dies here, then it absolutely slams the door on all the promises that God had given to Abraham. But Abraham got up immediately and did what God said. You see, you've got to learn, if you trust the character of God, it does not matter what God says, you do it. Because his character is who he is. He cannot be changed. It says God is the same yesterday, he's the same today, he's the same forever. I love Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, when it says, lean not on your own (laughs) understanding. Isn't it amazing that God does not give us the luxury of our own understanding? When God speaks, he speaks. That's why I told so many people from time to time I'm like the worst counselor ever lived. Because I believe if he says it, why are you sitting here arguing with me about it? Just go do it. Oh, maybe you don't trust the character of the God who said it. God said, Abraham, you take your son, your only son, the key to all the promises I've given to you. You take him up on the mountain and you take his life. Of course, the seed that God had promised Abraham, he promised him three things. He promised him a land, 
he promised him a nation and he promised him a seed. And that seed, of course, in Galatians 3.16 is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Isaac, but it would be through Isaac that that seed would come one day. You know, have you had God speak to your heart about something and you've been in his word and God speaks to your heart, but it goes against the grain of everything that you understand? And your mind starts screaming at you and saying, you're a fool, you're a fool, you're a fool. This wouldn't be God. God wouldn't say that. And yet you look in his word and it's very clear right in front of you. When, when people revile you, you revile not back. When you love people as Christ loved you, when they, when, they, when they deal wrongly in your life. I mean, how many things does God say in our life that are hard and they go against our understanding? But if you want to find grace in the midst of the storm, you better start trusting the God who says them. Because hinging on the unreasonable things that your mind says that he's saying lies the unexpected blessings of what God wants to give to you. And so he says to Abraham, Abraham, you take that boy and you slay him. You, you take him up on a mountain and you take his life. He had to die to his understanding. You know, I, I think of many times in my own life that I've had to walk through that. When I chose to resign from Woodland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that's a place, and I realize that, that many of you do not know where that is, but I was pastor for 18 years there. And I, I'll be 57 years old soon, and by the time you do this video, I may be dead. I don't know, but we're getting older. None of us are getting younger. And somebody came to me and said, Wayne, are you sure? Have you lost your mind in doing what you're doing? But in my heart, I knew that God had spoken. The understanding was not there. As a matter of fact, when you're walking with him, you cannot put it on paper sometime. And you've got to be willing to die to that understanding. Now, I want to clear something up before we go any further because we're just easing into this passage. And one of the things I want to clear up is make sure you've heard from God. There are a lot of people walking around today that are a little, little uh, fuzzy, and they're saying, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. Don't count on it. If you're not in the Word of God, you don't know when God is speaking. It's so important you know that. If my mother could call me right now, that would be a miracle. She's in heaven. She's been dead now for all over 18 years. And she'd call me, and I'd pick up a phone, and I've used this illustration many times to try to help people understand, how do you know when God speaks? And I'd pick up the phone, and I'd say, hello? And she'd say, Wayne Allen? <laughs> now, that's what she said when she wanted my attention. Wee Wee was her affectional name. I had, I had to be really tough growing up because my mother called me Wee Wee. You'd be out on the block playing this real adult game of war, and she'd say, Wee Wee. I'd say, who's that? I don't know, some woman. I don't know who she is. That's what she called me when I was growing up. But if she wanted my attention, she'd say, Wayne Allen. And if the phone rang and I picked it up, and she said, Wayne Allen. And I'd say, Mom, how are you doing? Wouldn't it be awesome if you could talk to him in heaven and just know what it's like? And she'd say back to me, Wayne, I've been gone for 18 years. How did you recognize my voice? And I'd have to say back to her, Mom, I spent so much time with you when you were here on this earth. I would recognize your voice anywhere. Take the scriptures that we're dealing with right now and throw them out the window if you're not walking in the Word of God because you're not hearing from God. It's trial and error. If you're not in the Word, you don't know when you're hearing from God. That's the key. The Word of God renews your mind. And God never speaks to you anything that would contradict what's in this book. You can trust His character, and you can trust His Word. But when He does speak to you, and you know He's spoken to you, and that, that understanding in your spirit is there, and He says to do the hard things, remember, the first thing He'll ask you to do is like He asked me to do, and all of us, and that is to die to our own understanding. It's not going to make as much sense to us as you think it's going to make. And again, I want to bring that phrase up. Hinging on the unreasonable lies the unexpected. Just make sure you've heard from God. And do not back up, and do not look to the left, and do not look to the right. You look to Him, and you take the step He tells you to take. That's when you find grace in the midst of the storm. You will not find it calling your friend, getting an opinion from somebody else. You're going to find there are a dime a dozen. You have to learn to do what God tells you to do. And I'll tell you what, wherever God guides, God provides. So the first thing that we learn is to, to die to our own understanding. That's the first thing. But the second thing we're going to find here, this is a very tender story. If you read this and, 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 and miss the emotion, then you don't, evidently you have no relationships that are meaningful in your life. Look what he says again, verse 2. He said to him, take now your son, careful now, your only son whom you love. Now let me ask you a question. What is the Isaac in your life that you love? 
Now, it may not be a person. Here, it was Isaac, of course, and born in his old age, 100 years old. When, can you imagine? 100 years old. When, uh, and when Abraham was 100 years old, he was born. I mean, evidently it would be very special to you to have a child at that age in life. But it doesn't have to be a child. What is it that God daily may bring you to the brink of choice and say, lay your Isaac in front of me? What, what, what could it be? I remember years ago in my own life, it, it, one of the things that you wouldn't think were that important was my bass fishing. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And God said, well, you willing to take that and lay it down? Now, remember, in this whole story, and it's a true story, in this whole story, God ne didn't make him do it, but he was testing him to see if he was willing to do it. And that's the key. Are you willing to do it? It's not necessarily that God's going to take you all the way through and make you do it. Are you willing to lay it down? Do you trust the character of God to the degree that you would lay down an Isaac in front of him? An Isaac whom you love. So faith requires a dying to understanding, but faith requires a dying to our emotions. You know, oh, oh Abraham, Hebrews, we read it in chapter 11, verse 19 of Hebrews, that Abraham so believed God that if God took him up on that mountain, and he, the way they sacrificed and gave an offering was to take a knife and cut the throat of the offering and to catch the blood. And, and, and it was a very gory type of thing. And, and he would put him up on this, this uh, huge altar that was lit. There was wood all around it. It was, a, it was a, not, a, not a pleasant thing to think about. But you see, he believed that if God made him go all the way through it, the God who told him, Abraham, I promise you a land, a nation, and a seed. That God is faithful to what he promised. And Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 says that Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. If he actually had to take his life, he'd raise him from the dead. What Isaac is in your life that you're not willing to lay down before him because you can't see any sense in it, but yet in your heart as you've studied God's word and you know him and walk with him, you sense that God's asking you to lay it down. You see, hinging on the unreasonable lies the unexpected. A very emotional time. Let's read the story. Verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place at a distance. Now, you can imagine the emotions going on between father and son. And Abraham said to his young men, look at this, look at this, verse 5, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Now, that just shows you the faith that he had. He was dying to his understanding. His understanding did not compute. Why would you give me a son, give all the covenant promises through that son, and then tell me to kill him? But then secondly, he's my son. He's my only son. He trusted, you see here, in the character of God. We were in, down in South Mississippi years ago in a, a co conference center that I was speaking at, and I had my, son, my, my daughter and my son with me, and Stephen was skinny as a rail, and just into everything. And we went out swimming one afternoon, went to the pool. And Stephen came ambling up and he says, Daddy, I want to go into deep water. And I said, well, I don't think you're ready to do that yet, but I'll tell you what, I'll catch you. And I got down to where the water was about chin deep for me. And I said, come on, Stephen, jump. And I remember him looking over there and seeing how deep it was on me and realizing how over his head it would be and looking at the water. And I said, I held my arms up. I said, quit looking at the water. Quit thinking of how deep it is. Now remember, I'm your father. Now jump. And suddenly he did threw himself with abandonment into my arms. Like to choke me to death when he got in the water, when he grabbed hold of my head. But he believed not what I, listen, he wasn't trusting what I was saying. He was trusting the one who said it. He died to his own understanding. In Stephen's mind, he knew the water was over his head. He died to his own emotion because this went against that. He didn't really want to do this. But he trusted me enough that he made the leap. That's exactly what Abraham's doing right here, taking his only son. In verse 6 it says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. You're talking about a man dying to his emotion and a man dying to his understanding. Why would he do that, you say? Because he loved the God that spoke it, and he trusted his character that God never changes. He is who he says he is. But the third thing is the most important thing to this whole message. You've got to learn to die to your own will. Will is king. 
Will is king. You can come to a place and say, okay, God, I believe you're saying it. Lord, I'm willing to go against the emotion I have, but until you do it, the joy is not going to enter into your life. You've got to go on and do now what God has told you to do. Now, you find him when we pick it up in verse 7. As we've just read in verse 6, he's got the wood on his son, and they're walking up the mountain. He's doing it. He's actually doing it. I know the only thing I could really relate to that of in my time, in my age, was when we did leave the pastorate, when we were pulling out of Chattanooga, going, going out across the west to Reno, and my wife and I said, we're doing it. We're actually doing it. We talked about it. We prayed about it. We'd gone through all the try to figure, second guess God out and figure things out. And we'd finally come to the place, this is what God has told us to do. <laughs> and we were actually on the journey was when the joy really started to overwhelm our life. We're doing it. By the way, you never get the luxury of joy before you obey, only when you obey. That's why this is a very important thing to break down. If you're going to make the choice, remember the joy is not going to come until you do what God tells you to do. He's walking up the mountain now. He already understands what God has said. He's died to his understanding. He's died to his emotion. He's dying to his will. But look, look, look on. Verse 7. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Oh, man. You tell me, this is a tender spot here. Here's a, here's a man's child. If he's, as, if he's as old as some people think he is, he's drawn up. He's not, he's not a little child, a little bitty child. But he's old enough to figure some things out. And, and he says, where's the lamb? I see all the, all the stuff is here, but where's the lamb? And look what Abraham says. Now, this shows you what faith is all about. If life's going to work for you, don't look at the lions. Look at the Lord. Don't look at the circumstances. Look at the Lord. If you keep your eyes on him, you'll be all right. But if you get them off of him, you're in trouble. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Well, I'm telling you, he knew something about the character of God. I'm, he knew what was about to do, but his son hadn't figured it out yet. He said, God will provide the lamb. So the two of them walked on together. Look at verse 9. And they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. Now look at this and bound his son Isaac. Now, if you don't have a son, and if you don't have a child, you can't even enter into this. But here's he, he's binding this son that was born when he was 100 years old. He bound him to the, to the altar and laid him on the, on the altar on top of the wood. But you talk about a man who trusts the character of God all the way. No turning back. No looking to the left or to the right. Just doing what God says. Listen, if life works for you, you better trust the one who's in charge of life. And you better be able to understand that whatever's coming your way, no matter what he tells you, trust his character. Because he, not allow, he does not allow anything in our life that we cannot endure. 1 Corinthians says, tells us. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. That's how far Abraham went with God. Let me ask you a question before we go any further. What Isaac has God been dealing with you with in your life? asking you to lay it down. Are you willing to do that if God would ask you to do that? That's, that's very key. Do you trust God's character enough in that? Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord. Now, you've got to do some study. Don't take my word for it, and we don't have the time in this message to cover it. But the angel of the Lord, who is that? We know he spoke to Gideon. We know he spoke to Joshua. We see him all through the Old Testament. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ right here. This is not an ordinary angel. This is the Lord Jesus. Now, can you imagine? He's in heaven, and he's watching the whole thing that's going on. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. You think that's what he said? Now, people read this thing without any emotion whatsoever. That's ridiculous. Here's a man who's got his only son on the altar. Why? Because God told him to. Does he understand it? No. Is his emotions absolutely afraid? Yes. Has he done what God told him? Yes. Is he trusting God? You better believe it. And when he heard that, Abraham, Abraham, I don't think he said, here am I. I think he said, yes, yes. Hey, you got me. Here I am. Here I am. He knew who it was. I'll tell you what, that's one of the greatest verses in the whole scriptures. 
of God's faithfulness coming through to a man that was willing to trust him right down to the very instant of taking the life of his own son. And by the way, do you realize that in the pagan societies of that day, that, pe that child sacrifice was very prevalent? Child sacrifice was very prevalent. And for him to do this, what he was going against, the grain of what people thought, the grain of everything that's happening around him, and yet he was willing to do what God said. Well, it says in verse 12, and he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. Well, don't you know those comforting words? For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Let me ask you a question. What's the chances of a ram ever getting caught in the thicket by his horns? <laughs> they live there in the thicket. But God had this one hung in the thorn. You know, the picture I always get in my mind is of Abraham and his son walking up one side of the mountain, believing God, not knowing that the ram was walking up the other. You see, when you're only on one side of the mountain, you can only see that side. But faith allows you to see the other side. That whatever God guides, wherever he guides, he always provides. I can take this into a tangible circumstance back when in the spring of the year before we moved out to Reno my good friend Randy York called me and said Wayne we need five thousand seven hundred dollars I think it was something like that and I said okay well we'll pray and I hung up the phone I'm thinking five thousand we haven't got fifty dollars how are we going to do this and I walked in the office the next morning after praying and saying God if you're in this I've got all I know is to trust you that's all I know that's all I know it's not going to be on a piece of paper neatly worked out it's just going to be when you tell me to move, we trust you. I walked in the office the next morning. The secretary said, by the way, a lady came by this morning and gave a check for your ministry. I said, she did. And I was thinking, well, thank you, Lord, for that $15 or whatever came in. And she said, would you like to see it? And I said, yes. And it was a check for way beyond the amount of $5,700 or whatever it was we needed. And I thought, God, when will I ever learn? And my question, I think, extends to you. When will you ever learn? When are we going to learn that when God tells us to do something, he understands what's going on? And when we walk by faith, we have to remember that means we have to trust his character. A man told me years ago, he said, Wayne, if you're ever going to walk by faith, you're always going to be at the point of desperation. I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to hear that. I would much rather have a surplus and trust God out of the surplus. But God says, no, sir. When you walk by faith, and when circumstances come your way that tend to make you think that you have to second guess what I said to you, look out, because that's what pulls you off the track right there. Get back on it and do what I tell you to do. Well, the scripture goes on. It doesn't stop there. It says, after the angel had so beautifully spoken to him and and he saw the ram, look at verse 13 again. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behold, a, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. It's interesting to me that Abraham and the whole nation of Israel later on, the way they encountered God and found out what he was really like was in a crisis of a, of a situation that they didn't understand. And they cried out to God in their desperation, and God revealed himself in a way that hadn't been revealed before. We sing the song, Jehovah Jireh, the God provider, but we don't realize this is where it comes from right here. Right here is where it comes from, Jehovah Jireh. God provides. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. I want you to watch this and said, by myself I have sworn, this is Christ, an Old Testament theophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. By myself, he says, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done, now look at this carefully, look at the wording, this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed, masculine, singular. Now, this is not plural. This is speaking of Christ. 
shall possess the gate of not their enemies, no sir, masculine singular, his enemies. In other words, the whole message of the everlasting covenant is going to continue right on, and Abraham had something to do with it, though God was using this to give us a picture of what it means to walk by faith, trusting the character of God. He's going to be faithful to do exactly what Abraham promised him to do. And by the way, one seed has to fall into the ground and die. Abraham fell into the ground and died in, in, a, in a figurative sense. He died to himself. He died to his understanding. He died to his emotions. He died to his will. But out of the result of that willingness to die and do what God tells him to do, out of that many seeds come. Isn't it amazing how many people are blessed when we're willing to decrease so that he might increase in our life? Jesus said the same thing, except the grain of wheat is falling to the ground and die. And he's talking about himself. He had to die so that out of his death, could become life for so many. So when you come to that place in your life, when you come to that hard time, and God tells you to do something that your brain screams at, but you're very clear that it's what God has said, remember to trust the character of God. Life will not work for you if you distrust the character and the motive of God. But if you trust Him, then life will start working for you as we'll build upon this message in this series on finding grace in the midst of the storm. There's a little boy that told his daddy one day, da every day, he says, Daddy, please let me go with you to work. Please let me go with you to work. They lived out in the mountains of Austria. And <clears throat> his daddy would leave the house every day. And what his son did not know, it was a very treacherous journey to where he would go through the mountains to do his work. Every day the little boy said, Daddy, please let me go with you. Daddy, please let me go with you. Finally, one day, the daddy said, well, I believe you're old enough now, son. You can go with me. Didn't take him about an hour to find out the struggle of that journey. The little boy wasn't so sure he wanted to go. And they got to one place where there was a gorge and a huge river flowing down through the Alps. And, and he, they had to cross a log. That's all they had, a log, to go across this, this precipice with a, a raging river beneath it. And the boy hesitated. And the father said, son, it's all right. It's all right. I know you're afraid. Take my hand. Walk with me. And you can make it. Well, as long as the little boy could see, see his daddy, knew he was holding his hand, could see the log, he seemed to be okay. And he made it across the gorge. They went on to the town. The daddy did his business. But the little boy was worried because the longer his daddy took with the business, the more the darkness began to come in. He knew they had to walk back. And he knew that if he couldn't see that log, what it was going to be like when he walked through in the darkness. Well, all the way, certainly it got dark. And they were on their way back. And the little boy fretted with his dad. Dad, I... I I don't think we can do this. Dad, I don't know. And finally the, the father said, son, 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 son. Just calm down. Come here. And he picked him up, and the little boy laid his head against the neck of his daddy and his arms around his daddy's shoulders. The next thing the little boy remembered, he was in his bed the next morning. And he said, Dad, what happened? He said, son, you just went to sleep in my arms, and I carried you across that log. That's what it means to trust the character of God. When we can't see it, we second guess everything. We die to that and say, God, you said it. I'm going to trust you regardless of what you allow in my life. And you're going to find grace in the midst of the storm. Father, for the times that we've refused that grace and frustrated as Paul said he didn't do in Galatians 2.21, we ask forgiveness. Father, help us to realize that you're sovereignly in control of our life. And that, Father, you're not out to get us as believers. You're out to conform us in the image of Christ. And so, Father, every trial, every circumstance, every word you speak to us has something to do with the plan you have for us. So, Father, help us to learn to trust you, to trust your character, to receive life as you are willing to deal it to us. And to learn, Father, to bear up under and not struggle to get out from under and grow and become the people you want us to be. We thank you, Father, for the grace that is in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name, amen. It's our prayer you gained a deeper appreciation for standing strong in the storms of life. Genesis 22 has been the center of Dr. Wayne Barber's topical study titled Character in the Midst of Crisis, God's Design for Withstanding Trials. This message is part of a four-tape album 
one of many other audio and video materials available for the purpose of equipping others to understand, appreciate, and utilize the power of the Christ life each step of their walk of faith. For more information on obtaining any of these ministry materials, write to To Live as Christ Ministries, Box 70336, Reno, Nevada, 89570. Or call area code 775-824-4945. You can also get to know us online by logging on to www.toliveaschrist.org. Browsing our homepage, you'll see for yourself Wayne's heartbeat for this exciting new ministry outreach, along with ways we can get to know you better, strengthening a relationship built on a common foundation, the concept that, for all of us, to live is Christ. Again, to reach us directly, call area code 775-824-4945 or log on to www.toliveischrist.org. Thanks for listening, and God bless you.